Hi, good morning, and welcome to Online Worship. Today's a special day in the life of King's Grant. On campus, we have our regular schedule of worship at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Our on-campus classes are meeting at their scheduled times of 9.30 and 10.40. But after church, we're all headed out to our fall church picnic at Bayville Farms, a 68-acre park just off First Court Road off of Shore Drive. There's a lot to do up there, but the best part will be fellowshipping with our church family and eating lunch together. Head out there right after church. We're gonna be eating around 1230, and so you'll have plenty of time to get out there. We hope that all of you worshiping at home right now will also participate in this church-wide picnic. After online worship, join your church family at the fall picnic. Now, I hope you have your Bible in hand with some paper and a pen to take some notes. Ken continues his fall series on The Mind Matters with a message called The Mind Deceived. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse three. Now that verse says this, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. As you've seen from this series, the mind is incredibly important in our spiritual victory. The battle for your mind is lifelong. The enemy doesn't give in and he doesn't give up. So let's not drift away and fall short of God's best. Now we've put together some inspiring music to help you focus on Jesus this morning. I trust that you will seriously sing along like nobody's watching and boldly offer your praise to God. As we worship together, pray for one another. If you're watching this during the premiere time, maybe share your prayer request in the comment section so that we can pray for you. If you have something that needs greater confidentiality, by all means, use our online prayer request form. As we prepare our hearts for worship, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we boldly come before your throne of grace and confess our failures to you. Cleanse, pardon, and receive us into your forgiving arms. Strengthen us as we seek to live for you. Guide us as we follow closely in the footsteps of Jesus. May you bring to us greater understanding of your word. Help us to guard our minds from the schemes of the devil. Open our eyes to the needs of those around us. Help us to make a difference in our community and make an eternal impact on a lost and dying world that is around us. Help us to catch a vision of what you desire for us to do for your kingdom's sake. Please eliminate from our minds anything that will distract us from hearing a fresh word from you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Great. 
Good morning. Welcome to this time of teaching. Welcome to our online service. And I'm so glad that you could be a part of of this time in God's word. I bring to you an incredible message, a truth from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, emphasizing that our minds truly matter. God cares about what is on your mind. He cares about your thoughts. Uh, we, We are so blessed to have a loving Heavenly Father who Scripture even indicates He knows the number of hairs on our head. If He cares for a sparrow, will He not care for us? So we hear again and again throughout the Scriptures that God truly cares about every detail of our lives. Well, He also cares about every thought. And although His care over the details of our lives brings comfort, perhaps His care, and I might add scrutiny over our thoughts, may bring a a bit more of anxiety than it does comfort, because sometimes we feel our thoughts are private, that our minds become our own property, and our thoughts never hurt anyone. Well, God would certainly correct us on that false view. Our thoughts truly matter. The condition of our mind can set forth our attitudes and our actions so quickly that we can doubtfully preempt a negative word or, or a negative response when our minds and our, and our hearts, our thoughts are not under God's control. So welcome to this teaching series, The Mind Matters. And we turn our attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and we hear these words. But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve, by his treachery, or by his cunning, your minds may be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Jesus Christ. And so as we take another look into God's holy word concerning how he truly cares about our thoughts, which in the scripture references our heart, our, our true person, our inner self, as we look at this truth from 
2 Corinthians 11.3, we read these words like a warning. And the warning comes out in this phrase, hey, I'm, I'm fearful, Paul said, in a very personal and endearing way to the Corinthian Christians. I'm, I'm fearful that your mind could be deceived, uh, led astray. All throughout the scriptures, we're reminded of the subtleness and susceptibility uh, of of our lives uh, concerning deception. We can easily be led astray, and that references our susceptibility. Uh, the, the deceptions of this world are very subtle. And so the scriptures describe this. In fact, I'm reminded of, of two significant verses in the Old Testament. In, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 9, verse 6, the prophet made a general assessment for God's people Israel when he simply stated, you are dwelling in the midst of deceit. God's words through the prophet came to God's people to remind them that you're living in the midst of a land. You're living in the midst of a culture of deceit where false truths and false inclinations and and dangerous influences can trick and lead the mind astray. But the prophet Jeremiah also said in chapter 17, verse 9, uh, that our hearts can be filled with deceit. Our Our hearts, our minds, our our true self can easily be deceived. So this is what we can conclude just by reading uh, the Old Testament of the Scriptures. We live in a culture of deceit, and we can also deceive ourselves. I find this to be very disconcerting. We we understand that the world can lead us astray, but ourselves uh, leading our own lives astray? Well, yes, the scripture says the heart becomes deceitful above all things. And so with just a little twist of the truth added with our emotion, we can quickly fall to that uh, dangerous temptation of actually believing something that's not true. Have you ever sat and just thought about a statement someone made or something that you heard through the media or on social post or have you sat and just gone over and over again false statements about yourself to the point that your your repetition and your obsession over that thought conditioned you falsely to believe that that statement or that uh, feeling was true. This is how we deceive ourselves. Our minds can be so undisciplined and led astray by impulses and feelings that we can actually hold a thought that we would otherwise have believed was was false, and we can convince ourselves that it's true. So yes, Scripture reminds us again and again, be careful. The culture around you can deceive you, can lead you astray, and you can even do that to yourself. Now, the Bible does say in the James epistle, uh, he who knows the good to do and doesn't do it to him, that is sin. Well, that doesn't really recognize deceit because there are times we know what we're doing and and we know what we're saying and we carry through regardless. Well, that is blatant disobedience and sin. But there are those times we think we're saying the right words. We think we're responding with the right actions, but we can be so deceived that we're actually participating in something very destructive. And so we We desperately need God's truth speaking into our lives, reminding us that we can be easily deceived. And this becomes the message of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. As we've read earlier, Paul said, I fear that the serpent, Satan himself, as as he deceived Eve, I'm, I'm afraid that he might deceive you and lead you astray from your heart of devotion to Christ. And so we need to be careful that we're not led astray and that we're not deceived. And so I'd like to uh, enter into 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 with you uh, contextually and then very practically. And so let's first begin with what I like to refer to in this time of teaching as the human context. We'll begin with the human context that becomes represented in verses 1 and 2. And then after this, we'll look at the warning represented in verse 3 the warning against having our minds deceived. But before we truly embrace the warning, we need to look back at the human context so that we might better understand how necessary 
uh, this warning becomes for you and for me. So let's look at the human context to this warning. And for that, we, we broaden our scope a bit from verse 3 to include verse 1 and verse 2. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, this is what we read. I wish you would put up with me in my foolishness just a little. And yes, please do put up with me. And then verse 2, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I've promised you to the Lord as one would be promised in marriage to a husband to present even a pure virgin to Christ. Now, Paul began these two very unique and to some unusually sounding verses. He prefaced them with, with a very personal appeal that in itself seems very unusual. In verse 1, Paul said, hey, would you put up with my foolishness a little? But I have a part of my heart to share with you. It would be the essence of these words. So Paul, from within his own human context, makes a personal appeal. What is that appeal? Paul said to the church at Corinth, would you put up with my foolishness just a bit while I share my heart with you? Now, why would Paul reference his own words and his own personal appeal as foolishness? Well, the idea of foolishness here doesn't represent that which be which would be a, a moral lapse or a moral indiscretion, but rather a statement that should, in other scenarios, be unnecessary. Have you ever had to make a necessary statement that felt a bit foolish because you really shouldn't have to say such words? Well, this becomes Paul's heart. Paul wrote into the church of Corinth to say, hey, I really shouldn't have to say this. But because those few people in the church are really casting aspersions against me and criticizing me and attacking me, there's some statements I need to say that, that really shouldn't be necessary, but nonetheless, I'll say them. So this becomes Paul's way of expressing why he really needs to defend his own apostolic work, his own influence as, as a Christian and as a leader, but also to defend himself and his love for the Corinthian church. So this is why Paul said, hey, I'm appealing to you in a way that might seem foolish to you, but nonetheless, these are words that I need to say. Now, we really do not see Paul's defense of his own ministry until we read in chapter 11 down to verse 16. And from verse 16 to verse 21, you'll see Paul defending himself. And others might think Paul would be boasting if they did not know his heart. So again, this is why Paul would say, I feel a bit foolish doing this, but I need to truly defend myself against those who are attacking me. In chapter 11, verse 13, Paul actually identified his attackers with this statement, for such people are false prophets and apostles. They're deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles for Christ. So chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians represents that portion of the scripture where Paul begins to identify his opponents and begins to point out their errors. He does so here with an appeal that's very personal and endearing uh, to the Christians at Corinth. Hey, I really do not need to say this, but I must. I need to defend who I am, and I need to defend my love for you. Now, notice in verse 2, Paul expressed this phrase, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Paul may also be indicating that his expressed endearment becomes another reason why Paul had to apologize for his foolishness. Now, it's not foolish for him to say, I'm really I'm really jealous of you, meaning that I, I care for you and I love you. But Paul uses the word jealousy here in such a creative way, led by the Holy Spirit, to reveal to the Corinthian church, if another teaching has led you astray, meaning some heresy from these false apostles referenced in verse 13, then Paul essentially proclaimed, I'm jealous of that because I have preached the gospel that led you to Jesus Christ. How would I not be concerned if another truth, a false teaching, led you astray? So Paul expressed, hey, I, I, I might be speaking foolish concerning some people's appraisals of my words, but I'm telling you, I'm jealous of you with a godly jealousy. I do not want you to be led astray. So now we understand Paul's personal appeal. But notice before we leave verse 1 and 2, this necessary accountability. So Paul named the false apostles, if not by their proper name, he named them categorically by stating, there are people among you right now who are teaching a different gospel. They're, they're false apostles. And Paul demonstrated this clearly and emphatically. In fact, in other places, he called them super apostles uh, sarcastically, meaning that they puff their own 
uh, their, their own importance up and they puff their own personality up to gain a following. So Paul identified them in chapter 11, verse 13 as false apostles. And then in verse 16 through 21, he defended himself. But in all of this, Paul offered a necessary accountability. The reason this was necessary is because, as we noted from verse 1 to verse 2, Paul used the analogy of, of a pure marriage, a pure and chaste woman. Here in this translation, a virgin, Paul used. Paul compared the church of Corinth to that chaste woman who was being offered to her husband. And Paul used in this analogy a beautiful picture of offering the Corinthians to Christ through his preaching and ministry of the gospel. And Paul knew that, that Christ himself deserved a pure bride as Christ was the per, is the perfect bridegroom. So Paul understood that the false teaching came in to dilute the gospel and to make the church impure. So Paul brought a very necessary accountability, a firm, a very firm accountability, both to the Corinthian Christians, don't follow the false teaching, and accountability to the, to the false witnesses, the false apostles, holding all very accountable by the truth of the gospel. This was a very necessary accountability. There was once a, a movement of spiritual growth associated with John Wesley that I discovered that I found very intriguing. It appears that, that uh, John Wesley orchestrated people meeting together during his ministry years in small communities to hold each other accountable for the deepest values and the most important decisions to be made concerning the Christian life. Wesley called this a watching over one another in love. In fact, as you dig deeper in some of these small community groups, Wesley formed a list of grueling questions that they could ask each other, holding each other accountable. Does anyone have inward and outward sin? Is there anyone who, who is hiding their faults? On and on again, these small community groups confronted one another lovingly with, with strong accountability. But I love the phrase that Wesley coined over these small groups. They were watching over one another in love. Well, this becomes the exact expression of Paul here. He loved the Corinthian church so much. He watched over them, not only with this appeal that he made to defend himself and his love and his ministry for them, but to show his, his love. He watched over them with endearing accountability, with love. So, so we see within human context, both Paul's appeal and this necessary accountability he brought both to the false teachers and to the Corinthian church members. But notice third from the human context, this very established relationship. In verse two, Paul said, it's, it's as if I were the one who promised you in marriage to your husband, and I desire to present you to Christ purely. Well, this becomes the expression of verse two from the metaphor of marriage. Oh, what a beautiful reference. As Paul looked at the Corinthian church, even as every church should see herself as the pure bride for Christ, the bridegroom. We're familiar with the metaphor of the bride and the bridegroom all throughout the scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27, there is reference made to, to the bride being presented purely to the bridegroom. Uh, a, an analogy for the church presenting herself purely to Christ as, as his bride being washed by the water of the word, being cleansed as Jesus would have the bride to be sanctified. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three, reminds us that this is God's will for us, our sanctification being set apart, being made holy. So the established relationship of which Paul referenced in verse two noted the, the power of how the Corinthian church was set apart because of their faith in Christ and how the gospel of Christ and Christ himself had brought change to their lives. Their, their forgiveness of sin, their being made brand new and brought perfectly to God represented their salvation as it does for us today if our faith is in Christ. And that salvation message proclaims that we've been set apart in Christ to God. The relationship was established as Paul communicated this to the church at Corinth. And so Paul said, my purpose in holding the naysayers accountable and in holding you accountable is that you would be presented to Jesus perfectly. Accountability always has in mind the established relationship between the individual and Christ. 
I would say the right accountability always has in mind the individual and their relationship with Jesus. Well, this was Paul's motivation from within the human context. He made a personal appeal. He held them accountable, and he did so because of their established relationship. They, they truly belonged to Jesus. They were set apart unto our Lord. Writer Myron Augsburger observed this about our being set apart. And I share this with you because this explanation truly blessed me. The words of holiness and sanctification are not prominent in much of our theology today. We've tended to speak of justification without the emphasis of sanctification. Holiness means that we belong wholly to God. This is also the meaning of sanctification. Being set apart is God's own possession as his own people. When this begins internally with the heart, with the mind, the transformation becomes something that affects the total person. In other words, and Paul would say this clearly to us today, through your faith in Christ, you've been set apart, made right, set apart, made pleasing unto him through what Jesus did on the cross. This should affect your whole life. But there were those in the church at Corinth, as there are today, listening to other false messages that began to affect their thoughts, causing them to be deceived. So we now turn from the human context to the warning against the deception that came from within the church from those false teachers. And here comes the, the warning in verse 3. We've read this, and hear this again. Paul wrote, I fear, I fear that as the serpent deceives, de deceived Eve, that you too might have your minds led astray and become corrupted from your devotion to Jesus Christ. Now do you know why we read verse 1 and 2 and understood the human context? There was deep endearment Paul felt for the Corinthian church, and that has given such force to the warning in verse 3. Oh, I fear that you would be led astray. Don't be led astray. This is not who you are. The, the twisted lies and truths that can deceive your mind oh, need, need, to be, need to be demolished and, and pushed away because of who you are in Jesus your faith in what Christ did on the cross has made you fully and rightly belonging to God. Don't allow that truth to become clouded and, and, and dislodged out of your life so that you're believing every wind that comes along. So, yes, the warning against the deception obviously becomes the, the pinnacle of these words that Paul shares with the church at, at Corinth. And the, the analogy Paul was led by God to use in verse 3 for this warning becomes a deeply disturbing analogy that your minds could be led astray even as Eve was deceived by the serpent, by the devil. We understand, obviously, from the scriptures, the fall of man into sin from Genesis chapter 3. Paul knew and was convinced of that which we are today, that the reference to the fall of man was no analogous reference, no fanciful tale or metaphor, but a real piece of human history and biblical history where Satan himself was the key actor deceiving man and causing man to fall to sin. Eve becomes the sole reference here for Paul simply because she was the other part of that conversation between Satan and mankind. But we know that Adam was a part of this fall. He was the one through whom this allowance was made, and Eve was deceived, and many say Adam was not, but he he was led by, by Eve's deception. So we see this, this fall of man where Adam has been noted as the the, the one who through whom uh, sin entered. But Eve here references that truth by being the one who actually heard the deceiving words of the serpent, of Satan himself. This becomes, again, such a disturbing um, apposition to our own uh, tendencies to fall into deception. The term deception, both from the Old and the New Testament, has with it the deep meaning of simply being led astray to that which would destroy, being, being led blindly away to that which would destroy. So now that we understand this, this deception and how this deception found, uh, found a correlation with the fall of man from Genesis 3, I'd like to share with you four facts of deception 
uh, that, that we uh, are encouraged to look at just through the message of verse 3. Four facts of deception. The first fact announces the truth of one's susceptibility. The truth of how susceptible you and I can become to having our minds deceived. Uh, as, as Paul referenced Eve in the Garden of Eden at the uh, original fall of man into sin, we understand that Eve was there in the safety of her fidelity with God. How could someone in the perfect garden fall susceptible to the deception of the enemy? Well, this becomes proof that maybe even the strongest of us can become susceptible to the deceits and deceptions that come both from the world and from our own minds if our minds are not guarded. So we need to understand that the reason Ephesians 5, 6 said, hey, don't be deceived, references the fact that even we who are followers of Jesus can have our minds deceived. And we need to be careful of this. Well, here's a second fact. Fact number two, the way of the serpent. Two significant characteristics of the enemy, of Satan, of the serpent come to light here. First, he was very uh, he was very sinister. He was he was very um, he was very hidden, sinister, and and very covert in his in his actions toward Eve, even as he is toward us today. So he was very sinister, and he was very strategic. He knew what to save, to say. He knew what to communicate. He knew what a place to enter into to cause that deception and to cause Eve's mind to be vulnerable to the deception. Well, he knows the same for us today. He's, he's very subversive. He's, he's very sinister and he's very strategic against our minds. This is the way of the serpent. This is the second fact of deception is that the enemy, uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 describes him as a roaring lion circling about. Well, he's looking for an entry. To, to, to bring us down that place of susceptibility, that place of vulnerability. This, this becomes the very reason why we need to walk circumspectfully and to watch. Because I, I dare say most people know their most vulnerable areas into sin. Most people know their most vulnerable thought that would bring fear and doubt and uncertainty and, and lust and greed. Most of us know what would trigger that? And yet many times we walk, uh, we, we walk uh, almost blindly through uh, such opportunities that could destroy us without being very circumspect and very, very open and aware of the enemy's tactics. Well, this second fact of deception reminds us to be aware that the enemy is very sinister and he's, he's very strategic to bring us down, to bring deception to our minds. And there's a third fact of deception, the objective. Well, we heard this here in verse three. The objective of deception, and I'll read it word for word from verse three, is to corrupt your minds from a pure devotion to Christ. The objective of the enemy's deception, regardless of whether it comes from our own thoughts, our own undisciplined mind, or from some uh, medium in this culture, from some outlet of, of social posting or news medias, uh, comments from friends, false uh, faith systems, false and vain philosophies all fit into this category of arguments Paul mentioned uh, earlier in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're told of arguments we must demolish. And these arguments all reference those, those statements and those false beliefs that can work their way into our thoughts and into our mind with the ultimate objective, the ultimate objective of reducing our pure devotion to Jesus Christ. When Paul said uh, the, the enemy will, will corrupt your mind and take you from your pure, de pure devotion, the emphasis, I think, can really build upon that idea of pure or single-mindedness. You see, there are many who are double-minded, and I assure you, the enemy does not mind you being double-minded at all, where you may make a little room for Christ and a little room for other affections that are equally placed in your life with Christ. The enemy doesn't mind that at all because he knows that a double-minded person is very unstable in all their ways. Just read James chapter 1, and the Bible verifies this. So the enemy 
is concerned about your single-mindedness. He's concerned about your pure devotion to Christ. And his ultimate objective will be in your mind and thoughts to take your single-mindedness off of Christ. Now, he's a-okay with you taking all of your mind off of Jesus, but he'll be satisfied with just a little bit of your mind drifting from the truth of Christ because he knows then he can manipulate you into a double-mindedness where it's Jesus and. And all this becomes a dangerous place. Paul wrote, oh, the enemy wants to take your mind, corrupt your mind from your pure devotion to Christ. That becomes the objective of deception. And then finally, the, the location of deception. And the location of deception is the mind. The mind wherein our thoughts and our emotions and our will become birthed every single day, that becomes the seat the mind does. The seat of how we act and respond and think and feel and move and have our being. Unless our, our minds are controlled by the Spirit of God, living in our spirit, empowered by the truth of God's Word, allowing our minds to be singularly devoted to Jesus Christ. But when that's not in place, then obviously the mind is the seat of deceit. Will we buy into any truth that could ultimately lead to despair and doubt and fear and, and other thoughts and actions that would become destructive in our own lives? So these become the four facts of deception. And I share those with you because verse three describes this warning against, uh, against our minds being led astray. And that becomes the message of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse one, two, and three. Our minds can be that place where, where we're easily deceived. And we need to put up a guard so quickly against that. We do that by being singularly devoted to Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you find some element of spiritual or religious perfection, but that you know that what Christ has done on the cross for you is the most paramount love that could ever be poured into your life. And your devotion is ultimately for him therein lies our incredible response to avoid our minds being corrupt and being led astray. I've, I've thought through these verses a lot. I've, I feel encouraged by these verses, but I also feel warned and I pray that you will also. I'd like to close with just four very simple conclusions. First, Paul held the church accountable to a single devotion to Christ. We're held accountable to the same. Second conclusion, Paul established a very precise standard for believers in these verses, that we would be unaffected by false doctrines. Paul established that standard for the Corinthians and that standard remains true for us. We should be so focused on Christ that we're unaffected by false doctrines or false philosophies that can come against us. Third, Paul's natural fear expressed that even active Christians can become deceived. We must walk circumspectfully because the third conclusion is very simple. Paul was fearful of the Corinthians because he knew that even, even those who claim to have a strong walk can easily be led astray. And then the fourth conclusion, this might be the most difficult for us to, to swallow. The fourth conclusion, every sin is deceit. Every sin that we allow into our lives is a form of the enemy deceiving us. And so today, church, uh, dear friends, faith community, I desire that you remember Jesus loves you. And I know you've heard that, but hear it fresh and anew today. God loves you so much. He gave his only son for you. He loves you so much that he not only has the hairs on your head number, he not only cares for you like he does the sparrows, but he cares about your thoughts, every influence that enters your mind and your heart. So today, can we join together in saying, Jesus, would you rule my mind? Would you allow your truths to condition my mind so that I'm not deceived by the twisted truths and the false beliefs of this world? Thank you for being a part of this study. Thank you for being a part of today's emphasis on the fact that our minds can be deceived. Stand against that deceit by having a single devotion to Jesus Christ. Let's allow our love for Jesus to be fanned into a greater flame for him and for his glory. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word. And now, Father, as we move beyond this teaching time to live our lives out in this world through relationships, through jobs, through careers, through, through studies, Father, wherever we may find ourselves this week, 
We pray that you will give us a single devoted mind to you so that our minds are not deceived and led astray. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Thanks for joining us. I'd love to have more conversation with you about this, especially if you've never had a conversation with someone about what it means to know Jesus. If you'll go to that website location that's on the screen right now, that message will get to me or to one of our leaders in the church, and we'll be right back to you as, as quickly as possible. There's no other truth greater than the fact that Jesus loves you. He died for you, and he desires that your whole life, including your thoughts, be made brand new. That's not only possible, it's a reality when we place our trust in him. Thanks again for joining us. Love you a lot. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Hello, men. The next Nobleman Breakfast is Saturday, October 16. This month, Tony Evans is going to talk about no more half-stepping. You've heard the phrase, all in. Well, God wants your entire commitment, dedication, focus, and effort. Have you ever heard of a professional athlete who shows up for only half the practice all season long? Me either. That guy would be traded or cut in no time. Far too many men are offering God a half-stepping approach to spiritual development, and then they expect God to show up and secure a victory when they need it. But it doesn't work that way. We need to be all in for Jesus. Remember that we eat at 8 a.m., watch a brief teaching video, and then have our discussion. We'll be out the door by 9.30. So take time to join the Nobleman group so that you can get reminders from me and have access to all the resources that I share to help you become the man of God you were designed to be. The October Benevolent Offering is going toward our missions partners in Guatemala, Catalyst Resources International. Last year, our church collected funds to send the children from Mimi's House Orphanage to school. While the Guatemalan school year has just ended and CRI is now looking ahead towards 2022. This upcoming school year, they need help sending seven grade age students to school for a total of $5,000. Kings Grant, let's do it again and support these kids in getting a quality education. We praise God for CRI and the way that they're caring so well for these children. And we are so blessed to be able to help in this way. Fontaine also mentioned the need for a replacement used pickup truck to deliver food and supplies to the villages. Their current truck is a 1993, so anything is an upgrade at this point. Whatever is collected over the $5,000 amount will go toward the purchase of a new used pickup truck. You can give to this special benevolent offering all throughout the month of October. Just mark your check or envelope as benevolent. Kings Grant, your generosity and love for others is life-changing. On behalf of the Green family and CRI, we say thank you for your love and support.